Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Lucifer, the latest episode of Legends of Tomorrow, as well as the latest episode of I Zombie. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time and I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I had to say about this week's episode of Lucifer, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of Legends of Tomorrow, and or skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of I Zombie. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's week's episode of Lucifer. So in this episode, it revolves around a case around a, a singer named Azara. Basically, like, I forgot what Jill was to her, like what she wanted for other backup dancers or whatever, but took her spot and ended up, you know, getting killed during a performance. It was like a fire uh, work with Diddy, which was like, whoa. Um, essentially, what it took, like, the whole case revolves around trying to protect someone who's really big and being in the spotlight, and obviously it reflects the story because, like, Lucifer in his mind is like, okay, so if someone in the spotlight's always going to be a target, and he thinks, like, okay, the best way to keep Chloe from being a target is because he's still bothered by everything that went down last episode with the bomb and everything. And so for him, it's like, oh, crap, like, I got to, you know, I got to find some other way around this, like, because he feels like no matter what happens, as long as Chloe's important to him, she's always going to be in the spotlight, because technically, he, he thinks his dad's, you know, conspiring and gets him and putting him in the spotlight, anyone that's close to him will be kind of put in that spotlight, so to push Chloe away from that, he decides the entire case is like, oh, I'm keeping her at a distance, I love that he's celebrating everybody, like, random people, he's like, oh, yeah, you're, you're my new best friend, like, oh, yeah, you're at the top of my list, Rob, my name's Bob, right, Rob, Bob, right, 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 Bob, um, even giving Ella that sh a new shirt, it's like what best forensic scientist or something like that. She's just super excited and loving it. Uh, funny thing about it, he's literally celebrating everyone. The only two people I can no I want to note that he didn't give anything to was Dan, because I guess in one, I guess you know the argument could be like, well, they never bumped into each other. But I'd like to think he didn't give Dan the, a gift because it's like no matter. How much of a trying to be friends with anyone is like I I can't fake it. Everyone knows I like don't like Dan. I really don't care too much for Dan. I'm not gonna. I, no one's going. Even my dad's not gonna believe that he's my favorite person. So, uh, you know that and Pierce. And I guess also Pierce would make sense too because it's like well the last thing you'd want is your dad thinking like your buddy buddy with Kane again because that might piss him off even more. So obviously he's trying to keep his distance from Kane because actually they didn't even weren't even they were in the same scenes but they never had any interactions at all this episode. So it's just kind of interesting when you think about it. But like the Dan thing that stuck out to me. I was like, right, he didn't give Dan anything, so I thought that was kind of uh, neat. And you could tell on some level it was kind of getting to Chloe eventually, just the way he was just kind of like, oh, no, 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 you're not in this special. You don't deserve to be in the spotlight. But I love the fact that even, like, probably not even halfway through the episode, Chloe's like, I know what you're doing. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, you got scared because of the Obama situation and kind of put things in perspective of like, oh, yeah, like, we could go, we could lose each other, and now you're just trying to keep me at a distance because you're afraid. He's like, I'm not afraid. I don't know what you're talking about, which is like, I feel like Chloe, like, I think Chloe usually has an inkling of why Lucifer does what he does, but, you know, I think this is the first time she, like, hit it so hard on, like, the nail, like, and so soon, too, to figure out, like, why he's, because a lot of times she won't always know and understand why he does what he does, but, um, usually it's not till like, the end of the episode, she's like, oh, okay, I get why you've been acting the way you have been, but this time, like I said, she got it immediately, um, which she's kind of right. I mean, this situation is a little bit differently because like a lot of times, like it is that situation of like, well, it's something he even tried to explain to Linda. It's like, no, 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 I'm not worried about Chloe. That's not, that's not what this is about because the fact of the matter is, you know, it's, it's the day it's kind of being heroes that we are, you know, being police, uh, working with the police and everything. It's like, oh yeah, like me and, uh, the detective, like, we put our lives in danger all the time. Like, this is part of being heroes. But this situation is different because what separates us from any other time is because this is a situation where Lucifer feels like he calls. He feels like because of his actions of defying his dad, going uh, along with Kane and everything, he feels like that set is all in motion. So what makes this situation different is because he feels like he's the one that's responsible for putting Chloe's life in danger. So that's what irritated him the most, you know, about this particular circumstance, so... Especially because in his mindset, he's always thought like, no, 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 no. Um, I wasn't there for the detective that one time. You know, obviously Pierce was there for her, and it's like because he was so caught up in everything else with the center man, he wasn't there for her when her life could have been in danger. So I think that's kind of you know, it's one thing upon it, uh, itself. Like you know, this season just kind of things stacking upon themselves. Um, it was interesting, though. He even tries to kind of buddy up with Azara, uh, even though she's kind of a little... Even she admits later on, like, oh, I'm very narcissistic, trying to help her out and everything. She's kind of being a little bratty. 
uh, even trying to have sex with him. He's like, I'm not interested. So, so like, why are you trying to like, he's like, okay, the truth of the matter is what she's like, he's like, about someone I care about. It's like, oh, you're talking about the detective. It's like, how do you know? She's like, I'm not, I might be narcissistic, but I'm not blind. It's like, it's super obvious literally to everybody. Um, but it's like for him, he kind of opens up to her about the whole situation, which Azara kind of point can, you know, she can understand too. Cause for her music is the same way, the same way Lucifer feels about Chloe. She feels the same way about music. And it's like, you got to fight tooth and nail for the things that you care about. Because it's like, if you don't, if they're not in your life, then like, you know, you kind of feel like without those passions and those things and people you care about the most, like life is not nearly as worthwhile, you know? And so it kind of put things in perspective of Lucifer that it is like, trying to keep her at a distance isn't the right way to handle things. And I also admit, I really like that duet he had with Azara with the whole I Will Survive song. I was like, that was beautifully executed. I kind of had an inkling it was going to be like uh, her friend. Like, what is what was Cece's um, actual job? I don't actually remember what her whole uh, job situation was. But it turns out she was the one behind all this. And it's kind of for a super sad reason. Because she's been in love with uh, Zara for like so long. Basically, she wanted to sabotage everything so that uh, Zara would stop touring. Because it's like, oh, she's so focused on music. And for Cece, it's like, I don't want you to be with, I want your attention to be to me. You know, I want you all myself. I don't want to share you with all these different people. But for like Azara, she would never give up her music because it's like, actually, we talked with the conversation she had with Lucifer. It's like, I, it's very important to her. It's like, she kind of lives and breathes for it. But for Cece, it's like, I want that to be us and it's like azara never realized how she really felt about it and even lucifer like understands where cc was coming from but i think things kind of got cemented even more for lucifer when it's like he ends up protecting chloe because i think no matter what the situation is i think from this episode he kind of finally realized like if if i'm so worried about chloe being in danger like there's always gonna be danger then i you know he doesn't know how i say this but i think that's a mentality he might keep even more so like i said kind of reestablishing um some thoughts you know about the whole like Pierce protecting her uh, from that gunshot before, like maybe kind of taking that and kind of extrapolating it in this particular situation. Like, well, then I'll be there to protect her. You know, it's like Chloe's very important to me and I'm not going to try and push her away anymore. You know, it kind of it kind of got to a point, you know, I don't know, like because it, it seemed like this episode was an episode where Lucifer was finally willing to admit. I mean, sadly, it was under circumstances of like her going out with Pierce at the end of the episode. It's like, oh, I'm going to Zara's concert. He's like, no, no, it's it's okay. Because she's like, I thought we were kind of, you know, you were still kind of pushing me away. He's like, no, no, I understand. But And you see it at the end and he even talks to Linda about it. He's like, I think I made a big mistake. Because I think he's finally now willing to admit. He keeps denying it. He's always denied it. But I think he's finally willing to admit how he really feels about Chloe. And I think he, he's starting to feel sad because it's like he's like everything he's ever done like this most of the season has been pushing her away for one reason or another. Just, to, you know, whether it's because of the whole situation with his dad thinking like he put Chloe in his way. And the fact of the matter is he's so busy trying to get his devil face back and stuff like that, that, you know, he's he feels like he might have lost his chance, like something that really good, like because of how he really feels about Chloe, he feels like maybe he missed his chance. Um, so, which is like super sad because, you know, it's like they obviously have feelings for each other, but Chloe kind of always put that, you know, whereas Lucifer obviously acts out a lot of times because of how he feels about Chloe. Chloe kind of does the same thing whether she admit or not. Like, 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 uh, like last episode, the whole like situation of like, oh, wow. Like he's running around with Pierce all the time. It's like, what, what is that about? You know, it's like she gets a little jealous, but, um. Neither one of them is outright willing to admit how they feel about each other. I mean, because Chloe kind of shut that down because she felt like she was finally going to get an answer for Lucifer. But she felt like, no, 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 he's not giving me one. So even when he tried to show her his devil face and everything. So now that Pierce thing really quickly, I had some thoughts about it. Obviously, you have like, I, I love like really quickly about the whole Pierce storyline. For one, Abel is dead again, which kind of sucks. It's like if there was any connection to Abel being like, oh, yeah, like some key to Kane's way of becoming mortal again. Well, that's gone. I was like, oh, maybe there's a chance that she's oh, no, Cable's dead. And I can only assume back in hell. So, I mean, it makes you wonder, did anything change because of like all things between them, like between things got better between him and um, Kane? Maybe, I don't know, like they talked it out a little bit and kind of understood each other. It's like, oh, I've been in hell, but you've been in hell too, brother. So I don't know if that was enough to kind of mediate, you know, 
Abel being in hell, but who knows? Uh, but I, but I kind of brought that up too. Is like if Abel is dead, Lucifer is not going to bring him back, not even for one more, just because he called off the whole deal and everything, which is kind of a question. It hasn't really come up yet, but it's like, what happens if Lucifer does break his deals? Like, are are his deals cosmic level things? Is it is it because it's something that if he breaks it, it's one thing? But I guess they're not as binding contract like as you know you would assume. Not unless there are situations where Lucifer can do like super binding contracts type of things. But most more often than not, it's just a pure like verbal exchange because more often than not, Lucifer will keep his word no matter what. That's just who he is. So I wonder if there are going to be any ramifications for him not keeping his word and kind of breaking his promise. But nevertheless, the entire episode you deal with like a super mopey and sad Pierce. Ella's coming to him and like, oh my god, here's a box of compliments for I richly love it. And it's just like, oh yeah, here's something about your arm. Your arm is awesome. Oh, here's something else about your arm being awesome. Say two arms. And and she's like, oh, you're smart and you're so great. It says something about my arms, doesn't it? And she's like, yeah. And I didn't, I felt like it would have been weird if I mentioned something about a third arm. And it just, okay. And it's like, oh, she tries her best. It's so cute. And then she's like telling Dan to go um, talk to uh, Pierce because it's like, Dan doesn't always have the best of luck. And But when life does get Dan down, he is always quick to get back up. It's like, oh, you're like positive uh, numero uno in office. So him and Pierce go out, and it seems like basically Pierce brought him down, because Pierce started bringing off all these, like, melancholy-ass metaphors, and it's like, wow, that is super depressing, and even Dan's kind of like, I guess we are just dusting when it starts drinking, because it's kind of like, I think even Pierce kind of brought him down a little bit. Then Aminadel shows up, then but kind of combining all that with what happened, at, you know, with Lucifer and Chloe. Because obviously, Aminadel talks about the whole, like, oh, yeah, the fact is, I stopped everything that happened between you. I mean, to be fair, Lucifer did that, but sure, you can take the credit, Aminadel, about breaking off the deal and everything. He's like, oh, yeah, I did it. I passed my test. It's like, well, if you pass your test, Aminadel, why don't you have the wings anymore? It's like, well, I'm sure there's more parts to it and stuff. It's like, how can you, like, keep going like that? It's like, for him, it's like, I have faith. And even, you know, Kane's like, faith? What? Just everything's kind of shit. Why would you have faith? You know, just kind of like everything's kind of a, sm- a swirling... um well, swirling, swirl of shit. Not his words, but I'm paraphrasing here. But um, then Aminadel's kind of like, oh, look at, you know, look, if my brother can have that, then, you know, hey, maybe there's hope for you too. And that's what I'm wondering about the whole Kane situation. Because Kane seemed like he showed interest in Chloe from the beginning. But then in retrospect, it's like, well, we now know everything he was doing getting close to Chloe was for the purposes of trying to... Make himself mortal much like Lucifer. Now I'm wondering is, is his whole thing with, um, Chloe like legit? Because he knows how Lucifer feels about Chloe. So it's like, why would you do something like that? It's kind of a dick move. Not unless he's not trying to date Chloe and he's just trying to build up a friendship. It's like he's cut a lot of people out of his life. So maybe he's like, oh, I'm going to start with Decker. I'm going to make her my friend and we're just going to, I'm going to build a friendship like that. Like he has no intimate relationship feelings for maybe or maybe it is legitimately intimate because maybe he's trying to use chloe in another sense there's two possibilities that could go it could be like oh i'm using her in a sense of like lucifer and her like the reason why things happen between them is because they secretly have feelings for each other so maybe maybe in his mind he's thinking like oh if i gain a bond a bond between me and chloe that's what lucifer have maybe that's why her her nullifying thing works on him and makes him mortal is because of their bond is like maybe he's trying to create one as well or because he's trying to do this and piss lucifer off to the point that maybe i don't know i feel like I, that was in the back of my mind but i'm kind of like uh, that's less like i'm kind of going with the former of like yeah it's him trying to create a bond because he thinks that might activate whatever makes chloe special and makes people mortal i mean to be fair it still only works for lucifer like i said that situation has never come up maze has still been a full-on demon a minute though i mean granted his angel abilities kind of faded away but even when he was around chloe he still kept him anyway so it's never it only works specifically in lucifer so I kind of feel like it. my mind mainly goes there, but hey, there is a possibility of just like a, hey, I'm just a douchebag and I'm trying to be with the person because you like her. Or it could just be like, hey, I'm trying to be, you know, friends with her. So those are the three main possibilities. I lean more towards the whole, like, trying to build a bond just to use her to make him mortal. But ultimately, we'll kind of have to wait and see. But like I said, the whole situation makes you feel even worse for Lucifer, which... I'm not too surprised because, like, this season kind of took me by surprise because I thought that's where it was going to be from the very beginning. Like, oh, Chloe and um, Pierce. I mean, to be fair, she does kind of have a thing for Pierce, but it kind of went in and out just because of, like, he kind of pushed her way and kept his distance. But at the same time, you have Lucifer doing it, and he reached out before Lucifer 
could. Like if Lucifer had taken this opportunity to finally reach out, then maybe things would be different. Because you can obviously tell Chloe definitely has feelings for him too, but you know, uh, maybe she kind of feels like Lucifer just wants things to kind of stay the way they are and not want more. When in fact, he does want more. He just can't bring himself to admit it just for many, many cosmic reasons. So, I don't know. It's just, it's super sad. And so... It kind of ties in with the story, too, because it's like, oh, things didn't kind of work out for Azara. It's like, oh, yeah, I uh, still chose my music. I mean, granted, it's like, I didn't know how you really felt. If I had known, maybe things would have been different, which is just like them. It's like, if, Chloe, if Lucifer had told Chloe how he really felt, maybe things would be different between them. I mean, to be fair, CC went through the point of, like, hurting a lot of people um, just to try and scare Azara away from all, like, singing and stuff like that but still you know but still you know like i said it's a situation where you understand it's still not it's super not good and very, very terrible to what she did but you can understand why because it's like oh this is the person you care about and you just you wanted them to yourself you know you're a little selfish but i mean we're all entitled to our own you know to be a little selfish you know when it comes to the people that we care about and like and love you know i mean granted not to that extent but like, once again we, you kind of get the message behind it. So I, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Like, obviously, a lot of episodes do that. But it's just like, I like that kind of comparison when you really break it down and think about it like that. So And then another side of the episode is the whole Linda and May situation. I really appreciate Charlotte trying to be the mediator in that. That was pretty interesting. Sadly, it seems like things between them not getting better because it turns out like you know there's still the back and forth like linda tries to apologize she's apologized multiple times she's even given up aminadel because she wants to be friends with Maze. it's like it shows you just that your friendship means more to me that but for Maze, it's the whole fact is they oh you went behind my back you lied and everything because in Maze's eyes it's like i did nothing wrong you know and it's like technically she never did i mean because i'll reiterate what i brought up last episode they you know the claim is like oh we did it to protect you um at least that's what Aminadol is saying. Like, that's not necessarily what uh, Linda is saying. Because even Linda admits on multiple occasions, like, yeah, she was just being selfish. She really liked Aminadol. And that's kind of all there was to it. But for her, it's just kind of like, you you see both sides of it. Once again, it's just Maze doesn't like being betrayed by, like, one of the few friends she has. Like, one of the most important people to her is Linda, you know? So there's that. But also, it's just like... It's also something Linda threw at her. It's like, it's someone that you don't even care about, which is like, that is, that, that's the thing. We don't know if like Maze really doesn't care about Aminadil because she acts like she doesn't. She always has. I like, acted like, you know, subsequently since they're split back in season one, she's always kind of acted like she doesn't care. But maybe that's kind of her way of deflecting like Lucifer. Like, you know, he always kind of like pretend, you know, trying to pretend like he doesn't care about uh, Chloe like the way he does. You know, maybe, uh, you know, Maze is kind of pulling from that book too and just kind of ease her whole feelings about that just because she thinks like oh well maybe it won't work out and just doesn't want to go down that route again or is it just because it's like I don't know I would assume that that's that that there is just that element of it or it could just be the fact is like she doesn't like her two worlds crossing it's like Aminadel is kind of like one world and Linda's another I don't want both my worlds coming together I want them just separated because it's, like I said the biggest thing I feel like is the betrayal it's the fact is that you lied about it. once again I don't know if Maze would have taken it well if she had come out from the bed again. Because at the same time, it's not even just that they lied about it. It's also because, I mean, and that's kind of Maze's point too. It's like, you still did it anyway because I told you not to do it. And that was the biggest thing. But once again, for Linda, it's like, the fact of the matter is you've slept with so many people and he, you don't care about them. Which, once again, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say whether that's 100% true or not. But it's like, I picked this one guy and it's such a problem for you. I don't get it. But at the same time, it's like, I really liked him. Because Linda hasn't been in a relationship for a long time. The last relationship she was in, you know, depending on if you want to define it as a relationship. I don't know if she defined it as a relationship. It was probably more like fun. It's her and Lucifer. And even before then, it's like, oh, her and her husband were separated. So she hasn't been in a relationship for a long time. And it's like, oh, you know, a minute oh, makes her happy and made her feel good. That should be all that matters. But hey, it's just, you know, once again, Maze is a big softy and her feelings are hurt. And that's what it comes down to, you know. But I think what's kind of the nail in this whole situation, it was obviously that. But then Maze goes, you know what? You, it's because you try to act like you're better than us, like that you're the good one. And it's like, you know, I don't think she tries to pretend like she's the, like, oh, she's good or she's perfect or try to be on a moral high horse. It's just the fact of the matter is, I mean, that's the part of being human. No one is perfect. People are flawed, you know? But I think what was also the kicker was the fact is that she told Linda to go to hell. 
And I think that's just kind of like a, oh, because it also means a lot for her to say that too, because it's like you being a demon and knowing that hell is a thing and what it's like and everything. I mean, plus, this is also coming from the lady who literally almost died last season. So I think that's where, it, I think all that just kind of like, you know, hit hard. And even to the point, Maze ends up breaking um, the axe that uh, Linda bought her at the end of the episode. So it does beg the question, like, will there be any fixing that relationship? Could they ever go move past this? I don't know. I don't, I, I'm curious to see a way forward for them. Like I said, at the same time, it's like, if I lean towards anyone, once again, I understand where Maze is coming from, but at the same time, I feel like she needs to forgive Linda because it's just like one indiscretion doesn't, you know, deserve all of this. But it's just, I don't know. It probably won't happen until they have a heart to heart. Like I said, it's kind of the same thing with Lucifer. Things didn't really kind of break down between them, like kind of finally like things cleared up until after like Lucifer and Maze had like a, a literal fist fight last season um, where both of them were like badly beaten and broken, like, you know, badly beaten and bloody. That uh, things kind of finally came out. So maybe Linda and Maze need to have that moment. I don't know. I mean, I guess this is the closest thing, but it's still, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I'm curious to see how things go forward from here. Like, and the, so, I mean, and and it, it's actually kind of a perfect thing at the end that Lucifer goes to Linda because she's the only person he can rely on, especially because he knows that she's one of the few people that definitely knows how he really feels about Chloe and everything. Um,. But also that they're both in the same situation that relationships that they have, the people that are very important to them or they feel like they're losing them, you know. So it's just kind of interesting that at the end of the day, they're kind of both in that seat. So I don't know. Um, I'm very interested to see, like, you know, where all this takes us going forward in the next episode. Will, like I said, will there be a way forward for everyone, for Chloe and Lucifer, especially with the whole Pierce situation, as well as... Maze and Linda because I'm curious like obviously Maze is super pissed at Linda and very super pissed at Aminadil so it's kind of like is there any way forward for all three of them or at the very least Maze and Linda I don't know we'll kind of have to wait and see I mean hopefully when it's all said and done Maze will be like no you can date Aminadil and everything's okay but to be fair like will Aminadil kind of go with it because you know obviously his whole plans and everything like that I'm curious to see where he goes from here too considering the fact not just with this but also I mean well this kind of goes with his story because the fact is he thinks oh he has his father has this great plan for him and everything like that and and it's something that's the more and more I watch the show the more I'm kind of like I kind of am under the impression like your dad really doesn't have any plans. Your dad wants to give you free will. Like, I feel like he's giving humans in this world free will. I don't know. You know, obviously, like in Lucifer's eyes, his dad's a dick. It's like, no matter what you say, his dad's always going to be a dick. So, and even uh, like a minute deal kind of plays into that. Like, oh, dad's almighty and this and that. Maybe legitimately he is one of his two sons that kind of like, figure life out, want it more for them than just being like, oh, this and that, wanted his son to be more than just Lucifer, wanted Aminadu to be more than just the firstborn, like the angel who follows all the rules, like, he wanted to bring something to Lucifer's life, and he wanted Aminadu to kind of basically loosen up a little bit, be a little more happy, not so work-driven, and maybe it's like, whereas Aminadu thinks he's taking a step forward, maybe in the whole aspect, but thinking this is all a test, maybe he's actually taking a step back you know maybe this whole experience was meant to humble him in a sense of making him kind of taking time to sit back and relax and find his own happiness much like lucifer so that's where my mindset is on this but i'm curious like i kind of get the feeling like when it's all said and done aminadil is going to walk away from this season heartbroken because he's going to think no i've done everything i thought i did everything right but it's like i still don't have my wings maybe ultimately he will get his wings and his angel powers back at full like doing something this season ultimately we'll have to wait and see and the reason why I was bringing up the whole Linda thing, because like I feel like for him, it's like, no, 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 human attachments and stuff like that. No, I need to focus on my mission because even he was kind of like, well, Linda was like, oh, we should break this off. And it's like, I understand. It's like as an angel, I need to be focusing more on my duties and stuff like that. So that's where I'm kind of like, that's where my mindset is. But like I said, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, probably waiting uh, quite a little while to get an answer to all of that for a minute deal, but we'll we'll see. And now moving on to this week's episode of Legends of Tomorrow, a very fun, awesome episode. Basically, the entire premise revolves around El Elvis Presley, and interestingly enough, I was like, oh, that's so dope. Because I was wondering, it's like, oh, who are you kidding? It's like, I was like, oh, who is he going to be? Oh, Elvis. I was like, that's pretty neat. Uh, basically, this all revolves around Elvis getting a guitar. And the way the, uh, the shopkeeper was talking about it belonging to Robert Johnson, I thought that was kind of interesting. He talks about, basically, um, it's about that folklore about the guy who sold his soul to the... Um, 
devil, which is kind of interesting, because I think, at least it's this story I think I'm thinking of, not unless there's multiple ones, but there's like one that comes to my head, because wasn't it specifically related to Crossroads or something like that, because I think it's a folklore that, um, I'm, I'm sure it's been turned into plenty of movies, but I swear, like, didn't Ralph Macchio do a movie about that, like, a while back, like, a long time back, uh, based on that story, like, I want to call, like, Crossroads or something like that, I think so, it might have been based on that story, I actually don't remember, but, um, Nevertheless, I, I just I think that's kind of an interesting folklore, and obviously it plays into this episode too a little bit because the guitar that uh, Elvis ended up getting, well, n not necessarily just a guitar, but it came the guitar is it has a totem on it, which we find out is the death totem. It has the ability to not only raise the dead but also lead them. But I guess it, it, when applied, it could probably be like outright control the dead, which would be kind of interesting. Uh, the thing is, no one else in the like show touched. I mean, they touched a death totem, but they never activated it. I mean, obviously, like the death totems activate to the person that you know it rightfully clicks with. So I'm curious. I mean, it clicked with Elvis, but I guess that was more so like because of the instrument he was using and stuff like that. Because even look, because like Nate's like the biggest like rock and roll fan and everything, and he's like super excited about this. Even later on, it's like, well, I guess we're gonna have to like. Oh, I mean, I guess if we have to make Elvis part of like you know the team, I mean, we obviously we need him because we need like the Death Totem to like defeat Mollus and everything. So I guess he's just gonna have to like join the Legends. I was like, I was actually thinking about it back in my mind, I was like that'd be pretty neat. Obviously, with the whole time travel thing of trying to keep time in place, especially with these whole anachronisms, especially now that you know, like, that's releasing mollusks, the more and more anachronisms break time. So, I mean, cause, I mean, cause I was about to say, like, well, the fact of the matter is, they have a Maya who's kind of out of time. Same thing for Zari. I mean, technically, all of them are out of time. So it's like, you could do that, but I guess such an influential, I mean, that's kind of the reason behind the legends is that whole thing of like, because they don't have huge impacts on the timeline, which I guess the argument is, well, that's kind of mute because they are the legends and everything. But still, it's like, I guess they could do that with Elvis, but it would change time. So he's such a big part of time that it would change everything. So I guess that's where the argument is made. Um, it still would have been interesting. Like, it, they will never have, like, a... If they ever team up with a uh, well-known figure from time, it's only going to be, like, an episode thing. If not, maybe one, maybe two at most. If it was kind of, like, left on a cliffhanger or something like that. So it never happened. But still, it's kind of an interesting thought. But I love that Nate is all about this. Because he's even saying, like, oh, man, the darks must be behind this. Only someone as twisted as them would try and kill rock and roll. It's like, I bet that sick bastard dark is in the ska. I'm like, oh, that, that's amazing. Ska came before reggae. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> um, nevertheless. And I love it, too, that his passion behind it. Because he is all about, like, you know, trying to get a Maya into it, too. Because it's like, oh, man. Because for him, it's like, music isn't just about more, like, it kind of helps you find out who you are it's like it invokes these feelings it kind of helps you kind of you know you find out who you are through music it kind of, you know music that cuts through everything it kind of hits you in your heart and so and that's kind of what he's talking about like you know doing for um you know that um god elvis does you know but even like Amaya being like, oh, we've been through all these crazy adventures. So, yeah, but then Nate was kind of like, well, yeah, you know, the music thing is a little bit different. It's just like when it hits, you know it hits, you know? Um, just like seeing Nate nerd out the way he is about uh, Elvis. And that's kind of crazy because I always knew about the whole like, oh, yeah, rock and roll is the devil's music. But I, I wondered like how like accurately true that is to his own personal life. Like the, his whole uncle... Uh, being a preacher and everything. Well, I mean, I would assume a preacher. He, he's a he's a church man. Let's, let's just leave it at that. Um, being super against it and everything like that. Um, even kind of locking him up. It's like I was like, oh, is that really how? I was like, oh, is that historically correct? Is that how Jailhouse Rock became a thing because his uncle locked him up for playing the quote unquote devil's music? I guess not. I mean, I'm sure he probably maybe it's a situation of he would have wrote the song much later on in life or something like that. But that's just so interesting. Like that was kind. Of, I had no idea his. I mean, to be fair, it's like it's back in that time because he was the first one to kind of really push the rock and roll. So. Which I even love Nate kind of going off about that. It's like, oh, rock and roll led to this and it led to that. Hell, it even led to me losing my virginity. And it's like, it's like, even he had to kind of go, okay. Because, you know, that's the point where you kind of go, okay, like I literally shouldn't have said that statement right here in front of the entire team. But okay, it's already out there. Everyone knows now. So also appreciate that his uncle did have a turnaround. I mean, you know, it's that type of thing when you see in like a kind of like a comedy movie. It's like, oh, you got that stickler. But then it's like, oh man, they, they warm up and everything. I mean, obviously he bounced back and forth. It's like, oh man, listen, my nephew, he's on. Oh God, you released 
oh, you are summoning these spirits from the dead and stuff. This is all your fault, playing the devil's music. But it obviously turns around even at the end, too. So, uh, I mean, I guess it works out in the end. Like I said, I, I'm sure the show is just trying to be fun, tell an interesting and fun story. It's not trying to be 100% historically accurate. I mean, maybe the show is. Maybe I'm just, I mean, to be fair, things are kind of probably a little off and everything because it's, Uncle probably wouldn't have gotten so pissed about the whole, like, oh, the devil's music if, like, you know, the deaf totem didn't react, like, if Zari's totem didn't react to the deaf totem, you know, so. I also love this episode being that whole thing about, ugh, speedsters, because it's like, Zari's like, oh, yeah, we make these decisions about who does what until, like, I ultimately kind of trick Ray into doing everything, and then, like, Wally does not just like, of course, she's just like, uh, I for I'm going to have to get used to dealing with speedsters, and it's like, oh, you beat my, like, record on, um, I forgot on what, I think it was, Pac-Man, and it's like, like, who beat my score? You did? I bet you, you used fast fingers, didn't you? Just kind of, and, and it's, it's an aspect that I think was kind of neat, too, because she had to tell Wally, it's like, sometimes you need to slow down. Like, we have to be a scalpel, not a chainsaw. You know, we don't have to, you can't just rush in, because this is time, trying to fix time, and if you rush into everything, it's got, because I was about to say, because that's a situation where it's like, you have a speedster on your side, it's like, I mean, to be fair, like, Eobard wasn't all that crazy about, like, waiting all the time. I mean, to be fair, he knew how to kind of use, I mean, just who Eobard is, he knows how to use his speed to be more of a scalpel than a chainsaw, but it's more like, he he, he is kind of more like a chainsaw, a more carefully placed chainsaw, but still a chainsaw nonetheless. So I think it was kind of neat that Zari was there to kind of make Wally kind of like slow down. It's kind of interesting, like the two newbies of the team uh, joining up like that, like, and it just kind of like, which kind of makes me, they're probably not setting that up, but I think it'd be kind of interesting. The whole Zari and um, Wally situation. I don't know if that's something they're really doing or not. And this is just kind of like a Wally and Zari episode, like in a sense of like bunching new, uh, pairing them together like that. So that was pretty neat. Because it was also like, you know, because it it makes, you know, as a speedster, like I said, the whole way time works and everything, you're like, oh, I need to be moved fast. But it's like, hey, sometimes you need to take things slow. It's you have to kind of really understand everything. Like I said, be a scalpel. Um, and, you know, it was actually Wally who was able to get to the uncle because it's like, well, he knows exactly how he feels because it's like, well, really, you're just scared you're going to lose your nephew. And it's like, you know, he's like, I understand that. Like, you know, me and my dad, and, you know, we weren't, you know, he wasn't there for most of Wally's life. So it was a little hard for them to connect. And, you know, you know, it took a while, but eventually, you know, they they found their way to each other. Yes, like, you know, while it's kind of off on his own right now, but still, you know, legitimately kind of going back to what I was talking about, like the uncle, like I thought like, oh, he wasn't going to change his ways or something like that. When he was bringing that over to Wally, I was so certain he was going to get close to Wally and break it. He did. And I was like, I was like, wait for it. I was like, go ahead, do it. You're going to be a dick. You're going to break. Oh, you, you didn't. I was so certain he was going to break it just to be a dick, but turns out not to be the case. So Especially interesting considering the fact that she called Zari out for being like possessed by the devil considering she like I said her um totem started reacting like that. So I thought that was kinda but nevertheless it just it was just kind of an interesting thing. Um kind of a side note to this entire episode. I really love the fact is that um mixed stories, like is it me, but like I just keep noticing that more and more. It's like with every new episode, it feels like Mick is having his own little side stories. Like the team is usually divided, sure, but it's like at the very least, even if they're divided, everything, I mean, there's still, like, side stories and stuff like that in the past, but it's just, like, I feel like Nick, uh, Nick, not Nick, Mick has, like, the most, like, disconnected stories, because everything was about him trying to find his right axle and everything, and I'm like, what's up with, what's up with that? Like, why is that happening more? I feel like more and more, if it's not him just drinking and watching a sports game, it's like every once in a while he'll j jump in and kind of, like, play some contribution to the mission, but that's about it. Like everything else is just kind of like a side story. Like, oh, playing the game, uh, watching a foot like football game, and then chiming in is like, okay, barking out orders at one point in time. You know, it's it's like that. So I think I just think that's kind of neat. I mean, to be fair, his story kind of goes in with uh obviously with his rat um Axel dying. I was like, oh, that's a shame. And then also like it's kind of interesting because his um Axel when he became a ghost like grew big and then shrank back down and just dashed off. I was like, wait. So does it, I mean, we haven't really seen a lot of ghost power amongst this whole situation. I mean, this is our first time really dealing with ghosts. But um, I was like, oh, is that something only Axel can do? Is that something other rats can, I mean, not other rats, other ghosts can do? I'm mixing up my words super hard in this recording. I apologize for that. But um, I was thinking like, oh, can anyone else do that? And it's like, it never came up. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, with the death totem around, that's something I'm sure we could see more of um potentially in the future but uh it's kind of sad because i mean it kind of fits with 
uh, Mick's story because his entire story is like, well, he's not really big into change. You know, the team is changing things around him or changing on the ship. And it's like, oh, yeah, on top of all that, um, now his, you know, pet, his friend died. Which, you know, like, Mick doesn't really handle losing friends that well. So, um, I do appreciate Ray kind of throwing a service. He's like, oh, yeah, the first time I met, uh, Axel, you know, I was super small and he was kind of like super giant and we were inside the vents. It's kind of like, uh, I knew that one day we'd look back on it and laugh. <sighs> I was like, wow. Which is like, holy crap, was that actually your first time meeting him? It was actually in the confines of the show. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I, do, I don't remember the circumstances around that. Like, I'm, I remember that bits of the episode, but I don't remember what the circumstances around that was. But nevertheless, I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. And even Sarah... Uh, kind of giving some words at the funeral and stuff like that. And you see Mick kind of tearing up, but trying not to get too caught up in it. So there was a part of me that was kind of hoping, it's like, oh, is Axel going to be like his old ghost rat buddy? I'm like, because Mick is trying to film like, Oh, he's a ghost. He can't eat that. And then he doesn't eat it. And Mick is like, Axel. And he gets on top of the box and fades away. I'm like, oh, that's, oh, that sucks, dude. Oh, uh, the fact is, too, he was going to cremate um, Axel himself because he had his uh, flame gun pointed. At um the box so oh yeah and really quickly uh that was is that true that's something I never knew about um Elvis like I said um like going back to like the whether it's historically accurate or not him having a twin brother that you know had died it's like I knew I did that was a thing that was kind of interesting I mean obviously that played in the story so like I like I brought up like obviously the death totem is locked up but as we see in the end of the episode it's like it's still bouncing around so I guess it's like it's one I guess it's one of those totems that once activated, it doesn't never deactivate or maybe it's calling upon something else. Cause I'm curious, like, does it have a range on how many spirits, like can it, it seems like it pulls spirits from like the graves or whatever. Cause obviously the ones at the church. So it does seem like it has a range. I don't think it could go like, Oh, I'm going to summon the soul of this person. Cause like the person that first comes to my mind is cause it was near them. Like when it like near the end of the episode was uh Sarah and I'm like, it could potentially be used to kind of see Laurel again. So I don't, I don't know. Like, that's kind of where my mindset is on that. Like, obviously, like I said, it is a situation of it has to come down to who's the right person to wield it, which I'm curious who would it be. I would, like I said, I kind of get the feeling like there should be someone on the team who should wield it. So not unless ultimately they end up making, well, I don't know if that's the direction they're going to go with it. Like, they might come across someone who's destined to wield it. I feel like it would have to be, I don't know. Like, 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 I think that threw it, threw it out there at the beginning. Like, I do believe Sarah would be, you know, a candidate for one of the totems in some shape or form. So, I don't know. I'm curious to see what that ultimately does in the long run. But I feel like it might con have something to do with Amaya, too, because there's a the whole situation of, like, you know, like, it's something that Elvis had brought up. Like, he had, um, everything made him realize, like, oh, you know, we're not here forever, so kind of enjoy the life that we have. And you even have Amaya kind of saying, I love you to Nate, but Nate's listening to... Um, music from her people. Um, obviously, rock and roll doesn't really gel with her. His uh, and her, uh, and the music doesn't really gel with uh, Nate. But still, but she says a line of like, "At least we have, you know, there's still time," which is like one of which is like famous last words. Of course, I mean, obviously, the sad thing is we. The thing is that they don't, because eventually, at, like, with time travel and everything, like, Amaya will leave the team at some point in time and go back to where she's supposed to be in history, um, to raise her daughter, who will eventually give birth to Mari and Kuasa, so, the fa I don't know, I kind of feel like that's inkling closer and closer to her, her fate slash destiny, what that exactly holds for her, like, even we, you know, we have an idea, but we don't 100% know, you know? Um, and I'm curious to see what role the um, death totem plays in that. So, like I said before, I, all around just a fun, uh, nice little episode. That, uh, but I'm very curious to see where everything kind of takes us in the next episode. And now moving on to this week's episode of iZombie, another great episode. Um, I like that this episode kind of had a little bit of the funny, but also at the, looked at the same time like quite a bit of a serious side to it as well. Because obviously it deals with Liv eating the brain of a lady named. Annie and M Annie is like a hopeless romantic. She met this dude named uh, Alan. I mean, granted, they were kind of like talking and dating online, but they never actually met until now. Like, he's the reason why 
she was trying to like well she ended up sneaking into seattle which was a whole thing because that was a thing too it's like why did she sneak into seattle because it's like you're a healthy human so why would you need to like i mean i i'm still not 100 percent sure on like the regulations for coming and going from seattle i guess it's obviously you need special permission and stuff like that but still um to make it seem like if you want to go into seattle and you're a healthy human you can um if you're not I mean, to be fair, it's like, well, then why? I guess a lot of humans are okay with things being the way they are because not every human has moved. I mean, a lot of people left immediately before the walls go up. But like I said, maybe there's special circumstances around it. Nevertheless, um, but she snuck in for him. And Alan, played by Josh, uh, not Josh, the actor's name is Sam. I always blink on Sam's name. Uh, but, uh, you know, most notably... Uh, Josh from Being Human, the North American adaptation, which is funny because I was watching, you know, Deception uh, yesterday and I was commenting on the fact that it's like, oh yeah, that also had the actress who played Annie, who's from the, the actress who played Annie on the British uh, Being Human. And nevertheless, that's going off a huge tangent. Nevertheless, I love that Liv's like super in love and everything. And like right after telling Alan, it's like, oh yeah, the woman you're in love with and everything, she's dead. I mean, it's like, oh, there's so stuff about like, oh man, you want to have kids and you already think about your marriage and naming your kids. And it's just like, you only know her for like, you've only known her like a month. And then Liv's like, ah, because it's true love. And then Clive just grabs the like brain candy that she's been snacking on and pulls him away. And it's just... Even afterwards, she's touching on um, Alan. Is like, oh my god, like maybe you find, I don't know, maybe you'll move on from Annie. Maybe you find someone else, and maybe that someone's like right in front of you. And she's touching his face and everything. And she's like, oh, I'm so in love. Uh, even bothered going to a club, trying to meet with him, and it's just like so much on top of it. I love it. Just being super duper hopelessly in love and stuff. It's kind of adorable. At the same time, it's very sickening too. Uh, but still, I even appreciate like when they were going to the club, uh, the scratching post, uh, you ended up having, she dragged Peyton along. Peyton was like, okay, Robbie, I need you to go with me. He's like, no, nah, I'm not going. It's like, oh man, you need me to, I just, oh man, I guess these are the only clothes I have. It's like, oh, and they turn it into a little like modeling, uh, like little uh, montage, and I thought that was so neat. Uh, and then, like, you literally have Major walking in. What the hell am I looking at? And it's like, dude, that's my shirt. He's like, sorry, you know. I was like, nice job. I was, I was like, I was like, right. Those, like, the only other guy clothes that would be there would be Majors that you're up there modeling through. So uh, that was kind of neat. Um, it does bring up some interesting things about the whole Peyton and Robbie situation, because even Liv was like, oh, I thought you and Robbie were going to be like, you know, true love. And she's like, no, no, because I think on some level she still has feelings for Robbie. It's just always, well, to be fair, he cheated on her and everything. It's just kind of like an on and off thing. And it's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, he slept with uh, Caddy. So it's kind of like, uh, it just... I don't know, it's just kind of, every, different things come up, and it's just like, you know, obviously there were things between Peyton and Blaine, until she found out, you know, that Blaine was a bit fat liar and everything, so, uh, but it does seem like that is something that might be bubbling towards the surface, just so if she was looking at him, just kind of partying it up a little bit, I think, it's still there, uh, maybe it'll work out between it, because it doesn't really seem like Robbie's necessarily pushing for it, especially because she's in a new relationship with Derek, which I assume Robbie knows about, which, I don't know, I feel like he's not as kind of like, like the way he's acting towards, he's not acting the same way as he had previously been, you know, like when it was the whole Blaine and her situation, I mean, to be fair, it's because it was, well, it was Blaine, but also just because he had feelings for her, and it was just almost like, you know, it's, it just didn't work out, but nevertheless, maybe that's something we'll kind of see kind of happen this season. But uh, nevertheless, getting back to the case, which I also appreciate about this case, too, was the fact is that it was left open-ended. Um, this is a two-parter episode, so I was like, oh, man, that's pretty neat. Um, I think the season finales on both shows, on oh, seasons, seasons one and season two, maybe season one, not season one, but season two and three is what I meant. Um, they were definitely like two-parters, if I remember correctly. So uh, that was just kind of interesting that um, having one this early on in a season like that, but... um. Because basically it turns out that the coyote that brought um, her into the um, city turns out he's potentially a serial killer because apparently he does this. He brings people in and brings people in, coyotes them in just to kill them, you know, sell their organs, even ransom them off to their families, but never giving the bodies back and stuff like that. It's like, man, that is some 
it's crazy. I mean, like, to be fair, it's not like it's something completely dark. I mean, like, I mean, like, out of left field. I mean, obviously, like, Blaine's whole operation in season one, so it's not that different, but still, it's just kind of, that sucks, because it's like, oh, you, these people are kind of getting in for whatever reason, and in her case, it was like, love was driving her reason to come in to Seattle, and it's like, it all kind of led to that. Um, it turns out because those brains were sold to Dalton, who was selling them to other people. Obviously, one of his big clients being um, Blaine. So that was kind of interesting. Because he had like even had a profile. It's like, oh yeah, this is connected to a woman who has nothing to do with the woman that's mur that was murdered and just and found in town today. It's like, and Donnie's like, oh yeah, I understand. Wink. So I even love that Donnie really quickly is super into mimes. He's like, mime me up, baby. He starts miming. I was like, oh, the brain's already kicked in. He's like, no, I'm just kidding. The brain didn't kick in that quickly. Uh, but still, so that was kind of neat. Uh, just a weird thing to learn about Donnie like that. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it does seem like he is a serial killer. It does make me wonder whether it's him, Bruce, or whether it's someone else. I mean, to be fair, he was there burning the bodies until... Uh, and he tried to run away. But there's a part of my brain, just a slight part of my brain that's wondering, like, I, I, I doubt he's in on this alone. I'm sure he has an accomplice. But part of me was wondering, like, could that accomplice potentially be, well, for one, could it be Alan? I mean, because that was kind of like, it was all pointing towards him as potentially being the killer, which is kind of making things complicated because, like, Liv was super in love with him and everything. It's like, well, he's kind of a suspect. But it's like, oh, you know, Liv's kind of like, well, everyone has their problems, you know, but we can move past that. It's like, okay. Uh, but at the same time, um, I also love the fact is really quickly, like, him and Annie met through a Bridget Jones diary chat uh, group or whatever. It's kind of like how they ended up meeting. So, which I think I mean I'm not that familiar with the Bridget Jones uh, movies, especially when they were referencing like oh like uh, uh, people try to be this person, which I'm sure he was referencing like a character or something. And it's like I've never watched enough of the movies because there's like three of them, isn't it, um, to really know what they were talking about. So I wish I had, because then I'd understand the reference, and I'd be like, oh, okay. But I guess it's kind of like simple, like romantic comedy stereotypes about characteriz characterization. So I, I, you can kind of fill in the blanks with some, basically using the context or whatever. Nevertheless, I'm dribbling on. I do apologize about that. So. So there's a potential it might be Alan, but at the same time, I kind of there's a part of me that's wondering if it's Renegade or Mama Leone. Didn't say what she said her name was. Well, she pops up in this episode. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm just kind of a little mm, suspicious of her. I mean, to be fair, Blaine is hunting her down because Chase wants her taken out of picture. Because I didn't even notice. It didn't even occur to me last episode that she's a zombie. Not last. What was that last episode? Yeah, that was the last episode. I didn't even realize she was a zombie. Apparently, her thing is like zombieing people she brings in. Like, it's I guess for people. I mean, in particular, there's that guy Anthony in this episode. It's like he was sick and he wanted to become a zombie. So, which is a big problem for Chase and Fillmore Grace because it's like, yo, there's literally a brain shortage about to happen because they got like four to six months left of brain supplies, and the population of zombies is outweighing like. Uh, the 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 food, you know, the supply is greater than the no, the demand is greater than the supply because they were talking about even humans aren't really handling ha um giving their brains over, you know, anymore as much. So, and that basically, if things go sour, it's all going to be on Chase, which is sad because Chase has to handle all of this. Like everything that's going down, everything in Seattle is kind of on his shoulders because. What goes down in Seattle not only affects Seattle, it affects everything going forward. It affects, the, like, zombies in general, like, whether, you know, they will be represented as a protected class. You know, it's like, oh, humans and zombies. Uh, where there's no, no more division between races, but division between that, you know. So, there's a lot riding on this. So many people's lives and futures depend on him, too. So, he's kind of got to make sure everything kind of stays in line. Because it's like, if it doesn't, then... People from the outside might decide, well, it's acceptable losses to wipe everyone out if we can wipe out the zombie scourge. Plus, humans already inside the city want to kill you all, too. So there's that. There's a group called the Darwin Darwin Project uh, that basically want zombies to kind of donate themselves and it will give you money. Which is like, we don't know what that whole thing is. Which I'm wondering, could that be connected to... um. That could be potentially what Angus and his group are. Like, that might be... I don't know, because they don't really have a name, his little congregation. I would assume that might be them. It, just, it was just kind of a little thing thrown out there. So I kind of get the feeling that's what it was, because that's still a side plot that's kind of still 
growing at a steady pace that we didn't even cut to at all this episode. So that's where my mind is about that whole Darwin project, that is that whole situation. So which I'm sure that's not gonna help with the whole brain situation either. So also we ended up finding out that dear old Blaine is in fact the one who stole the cures. I'm so glad they got back to that because I was like, that's a storyline that was literally never resolved in season three. I was like, I didn't know who took it. Like at the time I was like, my money was always on Caddy. I didn't think film I was like it was either film film more graves or caddy. Cause I forgot what it was, but there was stuff that was pointing it towards like it could have been Blaine, but it's like, nah, Blaine wouldn't really need it. But it's like, no, in retrospect, I guess it's like I guess he got it because just in case he needed it in case he needs to take out any zombie competition which i mean hell that might be his sleeping gun against his dad in the future well because his dad um i mean it's not like these cures are permanent neither because it's like once you get cured you can still get scratched and turned back uh major being a major example of that but um I mean, to be fair, he doesn't know about his dad's whole being released situation, so, and his dad kind of got that whole thing going on, so, that's still an element in the story that hasn't crossed over, so. Also, Liv met that, really quickly, Liv met that dude, um, uh, not uh, Tim, um, isn't that the dude that, that's not the same dude that works with Major, is it? I'm terrible with faces, and I'm just like, I'm trying to remember, I thought it was, but I'm like, no, that's a completely different dude. Which, the fact, I mean, I'm sure he, he played his role because he's supposed to kind of get her, like, oh, she took her mind off of Alan, so now she's more fixated on him, and they were, like, hardcore making up. He had Ravi and Peyton kind of, like, ugh, looking disgusted, but couldn't help but look back and, like, ugh, look back and just getting really into it. Also, at the same club, Liv saw Bazio making out with a guy, which I love her being super passive-aggressive to him and being, like, Bazio is just like, oh, hey, Liv, and she's like, oh, yeah, hey, Dale. Oh, yeah, Dale. Kind of reminds me of that chipmunk, you know, basically referencing Chip and Dale kind of be like oh yeah uh he was the mentally challenged you know the one that was mentally challenged and the one that kept dragging down chip all the time and it's like okay bozzy was like okay um just being super passive aggressive uh because she doesn't have the heart to tell clive because like i don't want to break his heart uh which immediately my brain goes either it's something clive knows about or two it was most likely my what i think is most likely is like she was undercover so it probably goes hand in hand but it's like she was undercover at the time trying to like busted dude that's probably most likely what that was about that's where my mindset in on it it might be something that ends up being real it might be like oh she really was making out with a dude just because i feel like they haven't gotten to that point yet because it seems like dell is trying or maybe it's because she is trying maybe she's compensating for the fact is that she's trying to fill that void in other manners so that can she can stay with clive you know maybe like i said going back to it what i was trying to say before is like maybe he knows about it just because it's like hey she does what she needs to do uh, which I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's that. I, I'm leaning heavily on a side of it being um, just undercover work or something like that. But then there's another side of me that's like, but the small part of me is like, kind of like, mm, it probably it, there might be something more to it. Like it might actually be real, and she is cheating on uh, Clive. We just have to wait for that. I just really appreciate the fact is that Liv is trying to hook him up. Like, oh my god, telling all these things about Clive and everything. Um, to that new uh, cop, uh, Michelle, which the fact is they went out of their way to introduce her. I'm like, you, you're going to play some plot in the role in some part. And like, I don't know whether this is going to be like one particular episode or just like for the rest of the season, but you're, you're going to play some role in this. I don't know what, but I don't know. Just cause uh, just kind of interesting introduction to her. So that, that was kind of pretty neat. Um, I also love when Liv got the, um, sketch artist in there and start drawing i was like i was like that description i was like it's like he's got hair i was like no he doesn't the guy uh the coyote you saw doesn't have i was like oh you're getting him to draw tim r2 and it's like oh yeah it's like no this isn't the coyote this is a uh, this is tim the man i'm going to marry and stuff like that i even love the fact is i even just thought about that too like Liv was like oh yeah michelle she looks like she could be a great mother and Clive was like, wait, wait what and then but going back to it Liv is kissing on tim's photo and everything it's like the sketch artist dude was like, oh yeah, I'm excited. I was be able to get home early. And it's like, she's like, oh yeah, so I guess we might as well go ahead and knock out that coyote guy too. And he's just kind of like, mm, that poor uh, sketch artist dude. Because every time he interacts with Liv, it's always when she's under another brain. So it's like, She's always making life a little difficult for him every time he shows up. So I, I really appreciate that. So, But we do have uh, Blaine getting closer to Renegade at the end of the episode because he ends up curing that guy Anthony. And he was just kind of like, go ahead and cure me. It's not going to end. I was like, yeah, because he could get zombified again. I didn't completely, I completely forgot the fact that, oh, oh, you just turn him human, you kill him, and then you eat his brains. And it's like, oh, yeah, like now you can just track her down. I mean, granted, that's still not going to be a foolproof 
thing because it's kind of like, well, you got to have certain things kind of uh, trigger uh, visions. And something I even, really quickly, I didn't even talk about either that just came to my mind. Like Liv literally had not that much brains to deal with this episode because uh, she's even talking about how it has to like last her all week. And then like Robbie's like, oh yeah, you've always talked about going on a diet. She's like, no, no, no. I, I say that just to be anti-diet and stuff like that. He's like, okay, calm down. You're getting very hangry. And she just kind of looks a little embarrassed about it. So um, I think this is the first time she's... Now, there was another circumstance. Was that last season? Didn't she have to deal with like a weird brain situation? It was like the brain was in terrible condition or something like that. It was like very disgusting. Um, I don't think it had any adverse effects. It was just kind of a disgusting brain. I think that's the only situation. Like most brain situations are pretty intact and stuff like that. So, but this is the first time she really didn't have that much mainly because obviously they stole most of her brain. So, uh, kind of getting uh, also really quickly too was kind of getting to what I was uh, meant to kind of bring up earlier about the whole Bridget Jones because I do know that it is kind of narrated, kind of like a voiceover type of narration to it in some cases, kind of like her, you know, hear her narrating her thoughts, which Liv kind of does anyway. But I feel like they're playing more into that angle in this particular episode of like what's going through her mind and everything. It's like, oh, it's this. Is this me? Is this my heart pounding? Is this me loving for the first time? I love she said that for Alan, and she said the exact same thing about Tim the moment she locked eyes with him. It's such a neat thing, dude. Um, really uh, love uh, love the episode. I'm very interested to see what part two is about. You know, uh, in the next episode, what goes down with all of this. So. Oh yeah, I almost completely forgot. There's also the little bit of the um, update about you know. Um, Major letting um, Chase know about the video and stuff like that. Apparently, they're getting sued by the parents. That's interesting. It's like, oh, yeah, our son died, even though he's, te- I mean, he's technically not dead. I mean, he's still alive, technically. I uh, Just the fact is that he's undead now, you know, because it would make it seem like, oh, my God, he died or something. It's like, no, he. I mean, technically he did, you know, so it's, it's just that weird area. And, like, apparently they're being sued, so... Like I said before, way earlier, like Chase is just things are not looking good for Chase. Like there is a lot on his plate, and you can tell it is kind of taking its toll on him. So, take, uh, taking its toll on him. So, very interested to see where it all takes us in the next episode. But really, that's all I want to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.